welcome to the Stewardship Leader Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Stewardship Network. CSN exists to encourage, teach, and connect church and stewardship leaders to help them create and lead healthy stewardship ministries in their church. You can learn more about CSN at christianstewardshipnetwork.com. Well, everybody, welcome to another episode of Stewardship Leader. I am joined by my friend Blair Graham from Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, the Summit Church. And uh, Blair, it's so, so good to connect. I know we've been doing a lot of virtual meetings, but uh, this is another one of those. But you and I talked the other day and you told me some of the things that you guys have been doing and some of the creative ways that you've been dealing with some of the limitations possibly or maybe opportunities that you've had in the stewardship ministry at Summit and I wanted to share that with our audience. So tell us kind of what's been happening. How have you been managing uh, in this pandemic? And of course, with social distancing, everything we've been dealing with, how have you guys uh, adjusted for the stewardship ministry to make sure that you're still taking ground, that you're still pursuing uh, all the that you need to be doing through Summit? Because ministry doesn't slow down just because we can't physically be together. In fact, that's one of the things that I'm excited about talking about how you guys have adapted to some of the newer ways that you're doing ministry through stewardship at Summit. So just go from wherever you want to go. I know there's a bunch of things that we want to talk about. So whatever you're comfortable to jumping in, go ahead and do it. Yeah, thanks, Leo. It's, um, boy, what a unique season that we're in right now. I, I know that uh, coming out of the business world before I became a pastor, uh, there's so much that I didn't know about what it meant to be a stewardship pastor. And I feel like God's teaching me that continually. Um, but in a season like this, where, you know, it doesn't really matter what degree you have or what your preparation was, I think all of us are scratching our heads trying to figure out, hey, Lord, how do we need to make disciples in an environment like this where, where we're restricted in how we can meet in person? And mm -hmm. so it, it's just been a really unique time. I think there's been different phases of lamenting and grieving just the loss that we've had of not being together yeah. and uh, then finding kind of what the new normal is and in a lot of ways really trying to move from a posture of waiting to a posture of how do we actively just kind of take control of what's happening and, and put some things in place so it's been a variety of emotions and, and seasons that we've been in leo I, i've really seen God's abundant provision for the stewardship ministry at the summit kind of leading into all of this. Um, mm -hmm. There's a couple things that he had been directing us to pursue that were more digital and virtual in nature that I think are really, really helpful now. In other words, we kind of had these things in place when this all hit. It wasn't, you know, having to start from ground zero. So for example, our we have a one-on-one -on -one financial coaching ministry that for a variety of reasons, we had really just felt like we needed to move that to a virtual environment. This has been over the last year and a half. Mm. And uh, we just found we're, we're a church that has 10 campuses in our region here, this, the Raleigh-Durham area. And we just felt like when we were only meeting at our permanent campuses, it was limiting our reach to people, even in our church family, that we could engage and so that was really the impetus of what pushed us to virtual for financial coaching. So that that's actually been great. From day one of this, we've been able to offer that as a resource and a tool for people. I think the second thing, Leo, is we probably for the last several years, we've had this virtual digital, I guess it's a digital newsletter called the Stewardship Digest. It's just been a way that we've tried to curate helpful content to equip and disciple our people in a non-traditional way, at least it was non-traditional for us. And uh, we've really leaned heavily into that to be able to communicate to people in our church and, and offer that as a digital tool that they could take advantage of from the comfort of their own working from home environment. Right. So those are some things that we felt like God was leading us to kind of before this. You know, it's interesting about what you just said is that I think many of us had a bit of a, almost a, a premonition of, uh, I don't know if I call it that, but I, I think the Lord really has been working because I've spoken to several church leaders in stewardship ministry, but also a couple of our partners in ministry, you know, Dave Ramsey's organization, Compass, and they felt the same thing before this pandemic hit. 
they were already planning, they had in plan to launch different initiatives that were more digitally based. And as soon as this happened, the only difference was that they had to kind of move their, their target date a little sooner. Something that they were gonna launch 18 months ago is now, you know, been launched. So it's really cool to see that. I think the Lords had already been working and saying, you know, just get used to a new way of doing things. And uh, I, I really appreciate that because I think it didn't shock as many people uh, as it should have. And I think some of the, certainly some of the stewardship ministries that are established that have been already very successful at, at changing the culture at their church, they were already doing some of those things. But I think this just created a bigger ability to really influence more people and reach more people. So it's very exciting to me because I think it's going to have long lasting implications where we're going to reach more people because of this, this challenge, but also because of the media that's uh, available today. I think that's right. I know one of the things we've been talking a lot about at our church is, you know, what started out as an inconvenience and an interruption to ministry mm -hmm. has really in a lot of ways created a disruption and almost a paradigm shift in how we reach and engage people as a church. One thing that's been a huge win, I think for us, Leo, as a pastoral team, our team tends to be, I would review, kind of say our member care has felt very reactive. So as members of our church had issues or emergencies, mm -hmm. that would be what would prompt kind of a pastoral care relationship or engagement. And through this, I think our campus pastors have done a phenomenal job with their elder teams to say, hey, we are proactively going to reach out and try and engage our members directly over phone. And I, I say that because I think in a lot of ways, even the stewardship ministry, how are we engaging people? Is it reactive to what the needs are? Are we trying to proactively serve and connect with them? So that, that's been a way that we're trying to really change. I think also like even something as small as membership, um, oftentimes at our church to do to become a member, you have to go through a membership class. Well, for many people, if it's only offered at the church building, a certain day on the weekend, it just becomes hard to get to with childcare and timing. And so that's actually been a huge win to offer membership classes virtually. That actually kind of leads to, to one of our biggest new wins in the stewardship ministry, our estate planning ministry. We've partnered with um, an organization called Financial Planning Ministry, mm -hmm. and they, they would come to our churches for several weekends a year and offer seminars and then be able to help our members that were interested in getting a full estate plan done. And they pretty quickly reached out to us and said, hey, we know we had some live seminars that were scheduled, uh, but we're actually moving towards offering a virtual webinar. Would you be interested in trying this out? Mm -hmm. And we said, hey, let's, this I think could be a really good thing. I mean, during the coronavirus, people are very concerned about their mortality. They're concerned about their death. Do they have their a state in order? Do they have their affairs in order? And so we said, hey, let's just see how it goes. And I thought it was a huge success. People were directly asking for this. They wanted it. And then we were able to offer it in a very kind of quick and nimble way. And as we've been thinking about going forward, we feel like actually the virtual solution is a better tool for us going forward than even the in-person seminar. Because when you have multiple campuses spread out around um, our city, it just is much easier for people to log into a, a virtual webinar than it is to have to drive across town to wherever that seminar is being offered. So, so that's been a big change. I think it's a huge win. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I am familiar with the financial planning ministry. They're one of our partners, one of our supporters here at CSN. And when they shifted to that, many of the partners that, that they serve, over 100 churches and nonprofit organizations, colleges, all kinds of organizations that they support, and when they shifted to this, there was a concern because the in-person seminar, we did that at uh, Gateway for many, many years. It's still one of the partners that FPM serves. And they would have 100, 200, 300 people over a, a weekend, right? Multiple seminars over a weekend at different campuses. But that was a lot of work for the consultant. And it was a lot of work afterwards to meet with each person in person, right? So. Uh, it's a lot of work that goes into it. The cost is, of course, much higher because you have a person that has to spend multiple hours driving, going different places, and some of the consultants are in different places in the country and they have to travel. So there's cost involved. And this actually helped them to continue to offer the same level of service. I mean, the service isn't diminished in any way. 
the webinar is done live so people could still ask questions and and it's just wonderful the way it's done so i'm so so excited to hear that this actually has been so positive for you guys that and that you're actually considering doing this more because you have a 10 campus church right i mean it's not easy to, to try to say okay this round we're going to do these three campuses the next round we'll do these three you know people shouldn't have to wait a year or six months or three months to get that process started um so it's great that anyone at any campus of your church now can do it at the same time so it's really exciting what else yeah. what other wins have you guys had especially in the area of stewardship yeah so i'd say that's been a big win we have also uh had a similar challenge with even offering financial peace university mm. um, for us when you when you have mobile campuses which are campuses that don't have a permanent facility that meet in a rented environment like a school on the weekends right um we've only been able to offer things like financial peace university or classes during the week at our permanent facilities and so we've been wondering how can we get financial peace university as, as just an example to these other campuses and we said well hey we need to we need to consider doing that virtually we've been thinking about that and now our, our church just made an announcement that we are not actually going to physically reopen um, until the you know at least through the end of the year so we're we've already kind of made that decision we felt like we've just really been playing defense every week hey are we going to open or not and we yeah. said we've really got to start to redefine how we do ministry and be more intentional and strategic about it and so the elders decided that was kind of the right move obviously a really hard thing mm -hmm. but that just solidified the need to go to a virtual financial peace university and so that's something we're going to do for the first time here in September, we're planning to offer a class or two. And so we're excited. We also, our leadership team has said, well, hey, um, we had some classes going on in the spring that then we had to stop meeting in person and offered it virtually kind of in, in the process. Mm -hmm. And sadly, those were not well attended. So we're kind of with that as a backdrop, we're like, we're not sure how many people are gonna want to do virtual, a, a nine week commitment virtually, mm -hmm. but, this is part of where we are, Leo, in this season yeah. is just trying some new th things out and seeing what works and what fails and, and making those pivots. Yeah, I, I do think, though, because of having to switch from an in-person to a virtual while the pandemic was ramping up, while so many people were like, what is this about? Is this necessary? There's so many questions that we didn't have answered at the beginning that we have a better perspective on now. So I do think it'll be successful. Uh, Financial Peace University and Dave Ramsey organizations has had this available for some time. And I remember when we were at the CSN Forum back in March, that, which seems like a year ago now, <laughs> in light of everything that's happened over the last four months. But I remember talking to Kent Singletary and, and Ken Schaefer, uh, the guys that were there from their organization. And they talked about, you know, actually they gave a gift to everybody that was in attendance for pastors to go through a virtual FBU, right? Because pastors have a harder time attending, especially in their own church, a financial class. So they were offering a free gift to go through Financial Peace University, a virtual with other pastors from anywhere around the nation. And it was a free offer to just go through it. And I thought that was so incredible because not only did they offer that, but they did so because they found that it was actually very successful. They had run two or three of these chest type of FBU for pastors to see how it would work. And their staff are the ones that that managed it or, or oversaw th those classes. And they just couldn't say enough good things about it. So many pastors were engaging and, and it was a win. So they were offering it in, in a way to serve pastors. And I love that, but I don't think it's just for pastors. I think a lot of people, especially because of what's happened over the last four months, are gonna embrace new, this new way of connecting. It's different, I understand. And, and we still need to, need to get together uh, as people a fellowship uh, and getting together. It's, it's something that we cannot not do anymore. Uh, and it will eventually uh, get back to a, a normal. But in the meantime, though, we, you know, there are people who are struggling financially. So I think this will resonate well. What I what I think is a, a must, though, for churches is to realize that you have to do so much more marketing and communication about what's available because people are just isolated. So you know, unless you're posting and posting and posting and sending emails and letting people know what's going on, people are just going to miss it. And uh, by the time they realize, hey, this is available, you're three weeks in and it's too late. So I, I, I do see that. I know that that's one of the things that we are dealing with at our own church is that communication has to be a lot more, uh, more frequent than it used to be.
because when we got it together in person, you can connect and, and find out everything that was going on. Now it has to be done more through text, through emails, through uh, uh, video, Facebook Live type of uh, communication. So I think as long as you do that, I think you're going to see success in it. That's that's my hope anyway. Yeah, that's good. I think, Leo, just along those lines of like, how do you engage people that are not digital people or virtual people? How do you engage them to bring them along? Has mm -hmm. been something that we've been working through. One of the things um, that we've been having to deal with is, is we have a variety of people that had given, you know, the way that they chose to give was every week they would give by check. Um, that they would, that, that's just what they've done. Maybe as long as they remember, they wrote their check and when the offering plate came by, they would drop it in there. And so they, they weren't sure how to give. They've never given online. They've never done that before. And so, you know, how do you engage a person that's not an online person and, and encourage them to take that next step? And so we intentionally kind of identified who those people were through our accounting team and then sent a snail mail physical letter to them at their residence and thank them for their partnership and their giving and explain to them that in light of these current times that, that it would be really helpful for the church if they would consider giving in a digital way and, and walk them through how to do that. But also said, hey, if you're not comfortable with that, you can mail it in and here's how to do that. Um, and so that's kind of one example of how we've tried to engage people in who have just not been digital to, to take that next step and then just helping walk through with them. Is this a safe thing? Am I comfortable with this? Um, I think the other thing that's been really interesting that, that we've encountered is it's often, in my experience, been challenging to move someone from having enough faith to give for the first time. Um, that's a really big deal for someone to take a next step of faith to go from like, hey, I'm, I'm following Jesus, but I've just never trusted Jesus in my finances. I've never given to the local church. Right. And so one of the unique things about this season, Leo, is that there is a very evident need that churches have, right? Like, hey, we're not physically meeting in person. So people immediately think, wait, does the church, is the church okay? Does the church have financial needs? And then they see people with needs. And so we've actually had, um, you know, hundreds of people over the last four months that have started to give for the first time. Wow. And uh, man, praise God, you know, it's it's not about that dollar amount, but but that giver is taking the next step of faith of saying, hey, Jesus, I want Jesus to be first in my life. I want to trust him in this area. And so that's a huge win, I think, for just the discipleship of our people, Leo, to take that next step with their giving. I agree. And I, and I do think that whenever we go through a difficulty, it does make people more aware of not just of what's going on in their own life, but obviously those around them. So what a great response for your church to have, you know, people to say, hey, you know, I'm looking at my situation and maybe I still have my job. Things are still going well, but I know there's a bunch who don't. And for them to be generous in a season like this says a lot about the culture at your church. And that's that's fantastic. So I wanted to touch on a couple other areas, one being just how are you guys connecting with your volunteers? You specifically, how are you making sure that they're staying engaged because they're disconnected? And obviously they were serving in a very physical sense, coming to the church, running classes, teaching, doing one-on-one -on -one coaching, that kind of thing. But now they're somewhat disconnected because you're not meeting together anymore. So how have you been able to manage that the volunteer side of things to make sure that they stay engaged, that they're encouraged, that they're somehow still able to serve, which I know this is what they want to do. How have you managed through that? How, what changes have you made? What adaptation have you had to do in order to make sure that that's still a focus and a priority? Yeah, Leah, that, that has been a, that's been a real challenge and a hard thing mm -hmm. because these, these people aren't just filling a role of like, hey, I've got a job to do and they're doing a job. These are in a lot of cases, my friends, Right. the people that I'm used to doing ministry and life with. And so not being able to meet has been hard. Um, our stewardship leadership team, I've got a team of, of eight volunteers that kind of run and lead our whole ministry. We would meet together once a month in person for, for two hours, starting at 6.30 in the morning. And so we're used to doing that. And so we had to move all of those meetings virtually. So now we do all those over Zoom, much to our chagrin. But um, that's actually worked surprisingly well. We've talked about that we've lost, though, even in the meeting, just kind of the fellowship between people in the room. That's just hard when you're just a, 
kind of a, a thumbnail on a on a screen. It's just harder. It's harder to know when to talk in a group of eight. Yeah. Um, so that's been difficult. I've been calling our volunteers just with phone calls, checking in, touching base, and so that's been that's been a way that we've done it. We traditionally would have several meetings a year where we would gather all of our volunteers together and give them an update about what is coming. Hey, here's the events that are coming. And uh, we had to cancel our in-person meeting that we were going to have in April, but we're going to likely do a virtual meeting to give them an update on everything that's happening. Um, yeah. Even now, me telling you that, I'm not exactly sure what that looks like because I don't need you know, 60 people having the freedom to chat while we're trying to communicate. I, I've got to figure out how to do that. So yeah. um, I need to talk to you and learn from some of these other leaders that are listening to this podcast, how to do a meeting like that well. Yeah, you can you can do it. You can do a webinar style and then you could just assign panelists to talk so that not everybody can chime in at the same time. That's what I love about Zoom. It does give you some flexibility there to make sure that, well, it's no different than you being in a room with volunteers. Not everybody's going to get up and just talk out of order. So this is right. allows you to do that. How about the other thing that I really wanted to touch on outside of the volunteer connection is how have you guys been able to not just, I mean, you talked about a couple of the different programs that you're running, FBU, the estate planning, but how have you been able to connect with the actual congregation so that the movement, the influence uh, on generosity and stewardship is still something that's being communicated, right? You don't want to shut that door and all of a sudden it's not important. And I know that's not what you've done. So how have you guys been able to communicate to people maybe a little bit more organically? So it's not something planned. It's not an event. It's not a class. But have you done any any live events, any webinars, anything that might just reach out to the whole congregation, whether it's from a leadership effort or just specifically from your department? Yeah, so great question. A lot of this um, has really happened during our weekend worship experience. Mm -hmm. So everything that we've done since the COVID crisis hit has transitioned over to an online environment through our Summit Online Weekend Worship Service. And really the way we've had to try and redefine what does the offering moment look like? How do we talk about stewardship and generosity? Mm -hmm. And really kind of the pattern that we've developed now is kind of as the service gets started, um, the pastor that kind of welcomes everybody and talks about some things going on has been really connecting because of the generosity of our church. These are the things that we've been able to do by the grace of God, whether it's a virtual VBS that we've offered, whether it's being able to serve families that have lost their jobs and and need food or, or shelter or things like that. So trying to connect like because of your generosity, these are, these are the things that God has done. And then we'd love to invite you into that. And then we've also been closing out the service. So we've had the message in between and um, the teaching and the worship, all of that, and then kind of closing out and reminding people of, of how to give. Um, the one thing, Leo, that I feel like has been interesting is a lot of our, our people at our church have been saying, hey, there's real tangible things, felt needs that are happening in the community. What is our church doing to meet those needs? Mm -hmm. And so we've had this real kind of ask and need to respond to because of your giving, we've done these. The thing that I don't think we've done a good job on and we're, we're trying to get back to our roots, if you will, of how we talk about generosity is we give in response to what Jesus has done for us. And because God calls us to be a generous people and he calls us to honor him with his, our first and our best, I think in some ways we've moved more towards the because you give, these things happen. And we've moved, unfortunately, away from, hey, we give in response to worship and what Christ has done. So we're, again, we're trying to figure these things out and get back to like, hey, this is why we do it. Um, and also our pastor is just, we've had opportunities to teach on, you know, what does generosity look like in this season Mm -hmm. So those are some of the ways we've done it. But candidly, most of that has happened during the weekend uh, worship service. Leah, we've been considering what are some other on ramps to engage people into the stewardship discussion. And so we've talked about maybe even doing like a Facebook live conversation on, hey, in a pandemic, how do you get your financial house in order and just walk people through maybe like a, a 20 minute little talk or Q&A. And then as an as a next step to push people towards like our virtual financial coaching or FPU or our digest, something like that. So we're, we haven't done that yet, Leo, but we're talking about how we might do that. I think that's a great, great idea, simply because if, you know, especially with this thing not really letting up, you know, as you said, you know, your elders already decided that at least through the end of the year. And I know 
I know several churches, Andy Stanley's church uh, has already made that announcement public, but there are several churches, especially the larger churches, who have already kind of made that decision, but they've just not made it public because there's no reason to say six months from now we'll open or five months from now. So they're just waiting. And there's wisdom in that, depending on when you decide to pull that trigger. There's not a right or wrong. I just so appreciate the leadership of the church right now because they are really in a tough spot. They have to try to navigate, you know, between keeping everybody safe and getting everybody together. And everybody has different opinions. So my prayer and my support goes out to them because they need it. They, they're walking a fine line right now. But in the midst of that, regardless of how long it's going to take, especially if it's going to take more time, it's so important to find ways to engage wherever people are. And I, and I, I know I'm guilty of this, but I have thought about if I reach out to somebody thinking, well, you know, maybe they're busy. Maybe I need to email them and see if they're available. Unfortunately, these, you know, this technology with the iPhones and, and the smartphones that we have has almost made it not okay to call somebody just out of the blue <laughs> because, you know, you can text them. You can say, hey, I mean, I find myself texting somebody. Can I call you? Can I talk to you for five minutes? Which is silly because if the person can't answer the phone, it just goes to voicemail. But I think we need to, in this environment, we need to over communicate rather than think, think, well, maybe we're over communicating. Over communicate and let them tell you you're over communicating. I just think people need to be more connected, even if it is virtual. Really, right now, it's the only connection we have. So I would I would really encourage you to, to pursue that. It's not about doing it perfect, uh, and it's easy enough to get it started. But I do think that if you just start out with some practical advice that people are seeking, even addressing some of the emotional things that, that everybody's going through, whether it's fear, whether it's the, the lack of resources, maybe it's the unknown, is my job going to be safe? There's so many industries that are in the long run, uh, may still continue to do a lot of reduction. Uh, airlines and, and you know travel industry is going to suffer uh, for some time, unfortunately. And our government has done what they could to, to prop up some of the economic deficiencies through unemployment and those kind of benefits, but that's going to run out eventually. And when it does, I think we're going to see another wave of, of financial hardships. And I think if we can even stay ahead of that tidal wave and say, you know, here's how to prepare for that, I think it'd be very, very helpful. And who else is better equipped to do that but the people who are actually talking about money and focus on it? And that's from a biblical perspective, because that's what people need. They don't need the just the practical. They need to know the why and the how and all of it. Yeah. Leo, I, I had one other thing that that I think would be an encouragement to um, this community that we're, we're trying to figure out how do you engage people that are isolated? Mm-hmm. What are the ways that you can make them feel seen, known, connected to. Um, I have found that using a simple little video tool where I've been able to record short messages from me Mm -hmm. directly checking in on somebody to say, hey, Leo, I know you've got a lot going on. I just wanted to tell you that I was thinking about you. I'm grateful for the ways that you lead and serve at CSN. If there's anything I can do to pray for you um, or encourage you, don't hesitate to let me know. And then, you know, kind of send that message to somebody like you. Nope. I've been amazed at the response that I've gotten that people have just said, wow, yeah. thank you for a caring. A lot. It, mm-hmm. It's just a really easy thing. Um, and so little touch points, calling somebody. I mean, these are these are kind of the going back to the basics, but they just look a little different with a thing like a video over an email. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I think you're right. How do we get the isolated person to feel known and seen um, and valued are just so critical in this in this season. I agree. And just opportunities for people to connect because we do need to connect. It looks a little bit different now, but it's still a a deep need for us to connect. And even though this isn't ideal, right, it's not ideal not to to connect in person uh, for months, but I think we can get about 80 to 90 percent of the way there by by still connecting in the way you mentioned, you know, a, a quick video, a note, a phone call, and then just creating opportunities for people to continue to receive discipleship creating opportunities to talk and, and to influence and to, to encourage and support. So this is the same for me. And I, and I think it's something that I really appreciate that. I know that's your heart. I, I did get, by the way, to the audience that's listening, I, I did get one of those from Blair on my birthday. And it was so, so appreciated to get that from him because he took the time. It only took 30 seconds or whatever it was, but he took the time to share uh, on a special day to share how he felt about me and, and the fact that he was praying for me and all of that. And it meant a lot. You didn't have to do it, but you did it. And I know it came from a sincere place. And I think we underestimate how powerful that is because we all need encouragement. 
especially in a season like this. So I appreciate you, Blair. Thank you for what you do. I just love your heart because uh, I know you serve with a, a willing heart and you serve people really well. That's why I'm excited that you're part of this network and uh, so appreciate your time today just to, to chat over some of the challenges that you guys are facing and how you're turning those into uh, victories. So grateful for you. Thank you, Leo. It's, it's, a, it's a blessing to be your friend and to be able to learn from you in this community. Thanks so much for the time today. And I want to thank everyone who has joined us with this episode. Thank you so much for taking a few minutes to listen to this conversation. If you enjoyed it, please do us a quick favor and just review and rate this podcast so more people can find it. And if you want to know more about CSN, you can go to ChristianStewardshipNetwork.com. We have resources. We have other episodes and content that you can benefit from. And we would encourage you to send your your leader there, your executive or senior leader there, so that they can find out what this ministry effort is all about. Uh, because we believe that every church should have a stewardship ministry, a discipleship on finances that's so crucial to our culture today. So would you do that? Would you go there and point someone else to it so that they can benefit as well? Thanks for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time.